Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sandy and Friends. Tonight, we are continuing to celebrate Beethoven's 250th birthday with a look at Beethoven's chamber music. I'm delighted to be able to share that we have some very, very impressive musicians joining us tonight, including John Daly, Kathleen Butler Hopkins, and Patrick Hopkins. And they're going to be having a conversation with Dr. Sandra Dachau from the Hershey Symphony Orchestra. But before they get started in their conversation, I wanted to let you know that we want to send our very, very special thanks to our sponsors for our 2020-2021 season. They include the Hershey Company, our platinum sponsor, our gold sponsors, Penn State Health and Highmark, our silver sponsor, Cornwall, Cornwall Manor, and our bronze sponsors, McQuaid Blasco and the Hershey Rotary Club. And you may be wondering what season, because we are, are not able to have a season this year, obviously, because of the pandemic. But we are so thankful to have the support of these sponsors and other people, because we still have operating expenses that we need to cover. And once we are ready to get back on stage and perform, we will be much stronger for it. So we want to send our, our sincere thanks to these sponsors and invite all of you to consider sponsoring and supporting the Hershey Symphony Orchestra because our place in the community is so important and we cannot wait for that day where we can be back together on stage to perform for all of you. So again, we are going to spend the evening talking about Beethoven and in particular his chamber music. And I am now going to turn it over to Dr. Sandy Dachau to take it away. Sandy. Thank you, Susan Court. Uh, it's, it's a real privilege, a real honor to be here with distinguished guests. Um, let me introduce first John Daly of the celebrated Guarneri String Quartet. We have, I remember when the Guarneri Quartet first was on the, um, what is on everyone's horizon was everyone was becoming aware of them. And there were only a handful of string quartets that had really established themselves at that level. And I was just a student at the time. Um, meanwhile, they set the bar so high that everybody wanted to do the kind of music making that they did. And so now we have had an explosion of string quartets worldwide. We've run out of, um, Guarneri was a celebrated violin maker. Uh, we've run out of celebrated violin makers to name quartets after. We've run out of celebrated composers. Uh, we're, we're using vegetables now. We're using, no, seriously, when that's a joke, the zucchini quartet. But um, the, the truth of the matter is, is that there are more quartets than anyone can keep track of. And it's because the world is aware of, how, of, of just how life-changing this music is and how the, the level of performance that the Guarneri Quartet brought to this literature changed how we look at this literature, Beethoven and other composers. So uh, thank you, John Daly. I remember when you came to Eastman and I was a student the whole school was buzzing after that performance. Huh. And uh, I will not name the other quartets that had been in town that year, but I just remember one of my friends saying, there's no way they can hold a candle to Guarneri. And that felt good hearing them say that. And to, uh, I'll tell you a secret, um, uh, my boyfriend worked in Sam Goody's, remember that? Sam Goody's, the record store, yeah. remember records? And, uh, Hi, Nancy. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, Sam Goodies, he worked at Sam Goodies and one year for an Easter present, I got this big red box. And what it was, was the Guarneri Quartet, their box set of Beethoven symphonies. And I'll tell you something, that got me through many fights with him because I kept thinking, no, remember that wonderful gift that he gave you because that was, it was life-changing, it was amazing. And I'll tell you one other funny story about that. I was taking Sam Applebaum to the airport. Sam Applebaum, all the uh, string teachers know that name because of the wonderful materials he left us. But he's also the father of the viola player in the quartet, Michael Tree. And um, so I was taking Sam Applebaum to the airport and I had carefully by hand, one by one, recorded every one of those LPs onto cassette disc, cassette uh, tapes so that I could listen to them in the car. And I'd make long trips up to Eastman in the summer and that's what I would listen to. And so they were playing in the car while we were driving to the airport and Sam is listening and he's saying, who is that? 
And I said, oh, that's your guys. That's Gwinnery. And they said, I didn't know those were on cassettes. And I'm thinking, whoops. Uh, but, you know, but he was fine. He was cool. Um, it's just that we, you couldn't live. I still have those, by the way, in the trunk of my car. A box of those cassettes with the complete Beethoven quartets that you folks recorded. So uh, your work in the regard is have done our publicity. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I think I think I would have I think I would have had a lot of enthusiasm to add. But um, let me introduce the other guests because they represent different generations and different genres. Uh, Kathleen Butler Hopkins taught for many years, brought chamber music up to the northern reaches of Alaska by teaching at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. And the students that came out of the program up there, you would think, oh, Alaska, you know, that's like the frozen outpost. No, wonderful music. You said your son Christopher in high school was playing Opus 131? 132. 132, I mean, I'm, I was blown away when I heard that. So, uh, uh, Dr. Butler and I, uh, full disclosure, we've known each other since junior high school. We studied with the same violin teacher in Patterson, and um, uh, I could never catch up with her. She was always better than I was. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Patrick? <laughs> so uh, Dr. Butler now teaches with me at William Patterson University after a long distinguished career up in, up in Alaska. She's having a second career and helping us enormously raise the bar at William Patterson. And our students are so lucky to have a teacher of her caliber to work with. Uh, going on to the next generation is Patrick Hopkins, who full disclosure is the son of Kathleen Butler Hopkins. He's the last in a, in, in a, in, in a batch, in a litter of cello players <laughs> in her family. And, uh, uh, it is, it is so, such a pleasure to see him grow up and become a teacher. And not only become a teacher, but become a teacher that is attracting students from all over. In one year at the university, tell me the university again, Patrick, I know South, I'm gonna mess it up. South Texas College. South Texas College. Uh, what did they double or triple in one year? Oh, well, I, I think I started with two and at the beginning of last fall I had 18. Wow. Yeah. And um, uh, both Patrick and Kathleen have both done research into Beethoven chamber music. You did research into the sonatas, cello sonatas, and Kathleen, Kathy did research into, uh, into the quartets as well. So we, we're going to get some interesting stuff going back and forth. I shared with you how much I love these quartets and how that box really, really is a, is a gift that's still on my shelf. Box of quartets is still on my shelf. I'd like I'd like to turn this over to John, who has made all these recordings. Tell us what it was like to start a quartet and to watch it blossom into something that set the standard worldwide. Well, that was kind of frightening. <laughs> right. We had a, okay. had a we had a bit of luck when we started out in '64 because. Uh, the Budapest was just finishing and they had a series in New York at the uh, Metropolitan Museum. And by some chance, we, we kind of took over, I think, their series in our, in our first year. So we, we had great fortune that way. And of course, I grew up hearing the Budapest recordings on Columbia Records when I was a kid. Well, that, that was the schooling I had. But you don't sound anything like Budapest. You have your own unique sound, as did they, as did Juilliard. And as I said, when I was a student, when I was in high school, I could name off the top of my head, if you stop me cold and said, name all the, the great string quartets you can who are playing right now. I'd come up with maybe this many, you know, and if I really worked at it, I could come up with another five. Now they're amazing and they're all so fine. They're Look all at good. planted. They're hundreds now. They really are. They're, they're really, really yeah. are. And uh, um, 
how did it feel as that was starting to take off? I didn't get it. I didn't get you. How did it feel to watch to, to, when, when you began to realize that you were going to be able to push the boundary further than anyone else had pushed it? Because you did. I don't think we had any grandiose ideas like that. We were just, uh, uh, we just rehearsed and played concerts. We had no idea what was going to happen. What were rehearsals like? Uh, <laughs> I see that's his wife, Nancy, in the background. She's laughing. I must say, we uh, when we first started out, we had a series at uh, Binghamton at Harper College where we had to play 15 programs the first year. Wow. So we had to get busy. We had to get busy and rehearse. We, we couldn't fool around. So the rehearsals, I think, were probably very business-like, and we tried not to waste any time because we had to play 45 pieces that first year. Wow. And if you had to pick out some favorite quartets, do you have any that you could call favorites, or is it whatever you're playing? Well, I, I, I start out with the Beethoven's. In the Beethovens, in the Beethovens, if you had to pick out a favorite. Oh, they're all. I, I like them all. I know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anybody to say you have to decide because it's like, well, it's this one, but no, it's this one, but no, it's because there's all, something to love about every single one of them. Oh, wow. Uh, Kathy Butler, would you tell us a little bit about the Beethoven trios? Oh, okay. Kathy what? plays with the Hobart trio at William Patterson University. Before we talk about the trios, I just want to say how honored I am to be on the same Zoom with John Daly. I absolutely love the Guarneri Quartet. When I was a doctoral student at uh, Yale, you came to New Haven and did the entire Beethoven cycle. And that was maybe 78, 79, something like that. I remember. Yeah. And so that did inspire me years later when I um, had gotten my doctorate. I had an NEH seminar at Harvard with Lewis Lockwood on the Beethoven quartets. And my project for the seminar was to take a look at the metronome markings. Uh -huh. And so I looked at six quartets. I looked at Guarneri, Juilliard, Budapest, um, Cleveland, Tollock, and I can't remember the sixth one. And I metronomed um, the first theme bridge the second theme, second theme, development, recap, blah, blah, blah. And it went on and on. And I compared all the performances to Beethoven's metronome markings and what the deviations were. And by and large, Guarneri was the absolute closest to Beethoven's markings of any of the quartets. Oh. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of deviation. If the metronome marking was 76, some quartets would go from say 70 to 82. So there would be a lot of range of variability, but Guarneri was right on the money. And Guarneri was always my favorite quartet in terms of shaping phrases and how free the music sounded. So there was a real freedom in that playing, but it still adhered quite closely to Beethoven's marking. So you guys are my favorite group ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One of the things we were talking about, Kathy and I, was that Somehow when the Guarneri Quartet played, even at those breakneck tem tempos that Beethoven sometimes asks for, it never sounded rushed. It never sounded frantic. It just sounded right. And there are other quartets that are not even, if you, if you measure them, they're not even as fast, but they sound like they're going to go off the road. And uh, Well, a uh, good example of that is Opus 59, number three. Guarneri takes that very fast, but it doesn't sound so fast as you listen. It, it does sound fast, but it doesn't sound out of control at all. Right, right. It, it yeah. never sounds like it's going to go off the road, right. uh, fly off the tracks there. And um, so Louis Lockwood was Beethoven scholar, and you did delve into those uh, uh, tempo markings. Tell us, a, tell, talk to us about the trios. Oh, the trios. Um, <laughs> My favorite trio is Opus One, Number One, because every time we had a change of cello faculty in Fairbanks, 
it tends to be hard to keep cellists in that music department for some reason. It's very cold and uninviting for string players. So we had a lot of different cello faculty and we always started with Beethoven Opus 1 number one. So that's my favorite trio. <laughs> Do you know, I should point out to our listeners, Guarneri Quartet really, how many years were you together, John? 45. 45 and only one personnel change because your, your original cellist was literally a generation older than the rest of you. Yeah. And that was just inevitable that was going to happen. So Peter Wiley succeeded David Sawyer, but you see other, other quartets like Budapest, you can't keep track of how many there were. That's true. They had uh, Sasha, second violin, they had Edgar Ortenberg, and Jacques Gordetsky. So there were three. Maybe more. No, oh, I think there were I think there were more mm -hmm. from from what I can remember. They just they, they were I think there were three. Just and they're all the second violins. <laughs> <laughs> they're the ones who are dissatisfied, so they leave. <laughs> oh, then they come back. <laughs> well I like what you said about opus opus one number one. And I'll be honest with you, I was absolutely charmed by the, the ones that are designated work, work on opus, work without opus number, really early Beethoven works that he did not deem worthy of assigning an opus number. Opus, for, for those of uh, our listeners out there, O-P-U-S, it's a Latin word that means work. And a composer would, uh, after Mozart and Haydn, beginning with Beethoven, more or less, composers would append that um, with a number after a piece they'd written and it more or less helped keep things in chronological order not all the time but at least it was a start towards doing that and these were works that he didn't feel should have an opus number and I listened to some of them thinking these are delightful why didn't they're nice, they're nice pieces yeah, yeah exactly yeah. They're, they're gorgeous so um, what's your favorite what's your favorite trio well, I recently played the Ghost Trio. As a matter of fact, I played it with Patrick. I was in the Alaska Trio for years in Fairbanks. And then when I relocated to the East Coast, Patrick was a doctoral student at the time. So he was in the area. The original pianist was in the area. So we named ourselves the New Alaska Trio. The Warm and, Alaska Trio. Yeah. And so, so Patrick became the, the new generation of cellists, just, just like in the Guerrero Quartet. <laughs> also, I think the first Beethoven we did was Opus One, Number One. Oh, it probably was. <laughs> That's probably your 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 go to warm up piece. Patrick, tell us about your experience with chamber music. Um, well, before I talk, I just want to reiterate what my mom was saying. How much of an honor it is to be on here with John Dahlia. I mean, I learned the quartet literature with your recordings. I still listen to them. I play them for my students in my classes. So this is a real honor to do that. But. Um, Particularly, I mean, in in terms of Beethoven, and I know you brought up just my the research that I'm finishing up on the sonatas, and you know how and and I don't know maybe I'm biased because I'm a cellist. Really, the thing that sticks out to me in the chamber music is how Beethoven really elevated the role of the cello in in the genre. I mean, in in all of them, in in quartets, in trios. I mean, in terms of trio, you even have the triple concerto which, you know, is second to none in terms of difficulty uh, and passage work. Um, but if, if you, you know, I, I've played a lot of the quartets mainly. And again, as my mom was saying, I've played trios with her. I, I think we've done the Ghost and the Opus One and maybe another one I can't remember. Um, but I, I think that's why I really appreciate um, Beethoven's work because of how the cello became an equal instrument in in the ensemble, um, and you can see how that progresses through you know um, the early period, middle, and late, um, and especially you know if you think about the trios, you know you have the big Opus sixty nine cello sonata mm. that was published in the same group with the Opus seventy, the Ghost, and the E flat, the number two, Opus seventy number two, and those are all extremely substantial cello pieces, I guess. So I. Um, for me, that's that's really why I love Beethoven. I mean, there's obviously other reasons, but that's the main one that kind of sticks out to me. Do you have a favorite? A favorite. Do you uh, have a couple? Do you have a couple favorites, not limited to trios. 
Okay. Quartets also. And then Quart- we're going to throw in some other ones that most of our listeners may not be familiar with. Quartets, I think my favorites, uh, I would say 59-3, 132, um, and 18-3, I would say, are some of my favorites in terms of quartets. You know what I do when I call the finale to that? What? What? The Mexican hat dance. <laughs> <laughs> That was the first one of the Opus 18s, actually, that he wrote. Carlos. Yeah, really? Hey, that was, yeah. Have you seen the uh, notebook for uh, 59 uh, uh, 18 1, where, it's, where he writes down? Da, 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 then you see oh. on the next line. Da, 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 yeah. And then you say, ah, I like that. Ah, three's the charm. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, we are blessed it, that we have those those notebooks to see what his process was for eliminating the almost but not quite good enough ideas. Right. Wow. And you talk about how opus numbers keep things in chronological order. But when you look at all the sketchbooks, the way things were published and the way he composed them, it's not necessarily in, in that order. Like no, three, no, no, no. three was first and then, yeah. The piano concertos also. Right. Well, actually, some of my favorite little pieces of chamber music are down way down in the opus numbers, like eight, nine, um, the string trios. And students know those. We don't really get to see them performed very often by professionals, but uh, opus nine, um, well, the opus nines are hard. I mean, I teach that a lot to sort of they're, begin. The C minor hard. blows me away. And you well, know, they're so, a quartet without, without exactly. the fourth person. If, if you yeah. stop, unless you're listening carefully, you don't know there's not a second violin. Right. And his, he's that good at maneuvering texture. And but that's uh, what makes it very hard for the violist because the viola parts are always hard in those those string trios. Right, right. Yeah. Well, speaking of hard viola part, I played Opus Eight. Um, now was it eight or twenty five? I'm embarrassed. Opus Serenade, Opus Eight. Yes, the, with the flute. Oh, we know that one. That's right. I'm, we have a flutist back there, yeah, Nancy yeah. Valley. Wonderful oh, flutist. Is that was I right? Is that Opus Eight, the one with the flute? Which is, um, which is the string serenade in D major? Is that Opus 9? I think it's Opus 9 or Op- one of them is Opus 25. And I, I think, think it's Opus 25. Yeah, 25. I think it's, 25. Yeah, I think it's 25. I'm 25. sorry, 25. Well, yeah. anyway, the yeah. one with the flute, I remember doing with some colleagues when I taught out in Western Pennsylvania. And I was the viola player. And there's no cello. Boy, did I feel it. I mean, I don't think I ever worked harder than <laughs> being the bass line when you're not used to being, when you're used to being an inner voice. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not a violist most of the time anyway. So it's like, oh, I have to think about this in a whole different way. I have to drive this, you know, take much more leadership and how we go from one place to another harmonically. And that was hard. That was delightful music though. So those are little throwaway pieces that don't get very much opportunity to be heard. And they're all good, you know, they're all wonderful. Speaking yeah, of the viola, yeah. oh, oh, the trio oh. with the uh, flute is hard because you have so many octaves and units. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Very, right. Very, very tricky. Right, but it's fun. Nancy, is it fun to play? Love to play it. Played it with John and Michael and Arnold and Jamie and yeah. Well, she, she's name dropping very famous musicians. <laughs> yeah, really? We know who they are. I'll Those are nice people play. to play with. Those are nice people to be on a first name basis with. Yeah. So privileged, yeah. But it's a hard piece, a really hard piece. It's- well, it is a hard piece, it, it, and it's a hard piece. You have no cellist to set up the resonance down there. So you just have to, uh, especially if you're playing in a large hall, that's, that's difficult right there because the sound can start getting monotonous after a while without generating those missing overtones. You don't have that bottom octave, and but having said that, we had a great time playing that. I have a question for my two colleagues here, who know more about it than I do. When was Beethoven really deaf in terms of the opus numbers? I was That's, just reading. He started to go deaf around 1798. I, yeah. Second symphony. 
that's yeah. Second Symphony. Yeah. Second Symphony. Opus. What is it? Opus Twenty One. Thereabouts. Something like that. that. Something that like early, that. Huh? Um, it was. And he was not, totally. He was totally deaf for fifteen years. Totally, completely. But what most people don't understand, because this is hard to describe, he was not completely deaf, and he had workarounds that he used such as like a uh, oh, kind of a shell, a metal shell that he would put over the keyboard. And he kind of, th this was in the Beethoven movie actually. It was one of the more, one of the more accurate things in that movie where he would kind of lean in and actually lean against the shell. It was probably aluminum or something. Well, was he, he hearing vibrations? He was hearing amplification. Not, not no? no, I think he was hearing, remember he was hearing this all in his head too. Right. He never stopped being able to process what was on the page to, to his brain and knowing what it's, he could never have written the stuff at the end. If he had, he'd never written the com, 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 complexity of things if he couldn't make that connection. And he was, so it was not, and it was not an off on switch. You know, we have the Heilige Gestalt Testament and where he's, you know, contemplating suicide and all that. And he finally decides he's going to triumph over all this. Well, he wasn't immediately deaf. It was a long, uncomfortable. A long process. Yeah. Right. A long, uncomfortable, yeah. embarrassing uh, road for him. And um, even towards the end, I, you, know, I, you don't know what, quite what to believe sometimes from these first person accounts of his friends, but he could hear certain things. Uh, a, a, a kid shrieked at a party and he jumped because. He hadn't heard anything for a while and he heard that it it's it was a long process but remember it's he just he had this all inside of him it was all internalized and he had to just get it out he couldn't enjoy your playing or anybody else's playing but he could still imagine it all he could still take visual cues what did they say at the ninth symphony they, he was conducting more or less. He was swinging his arms. The, the music finished and he kept on going. And right. they had to turn him around to see that all these people were wildly applauding. That's probably accurate. And um, your heart goes out to someone who is experiencing that, to have what they treasure the most taken from them. And that's, I guess, another reason why he figures in our imagination, because he just overcame so much. And, well, and he was such a performer and he he continued to perform as he was going deaf. I guess it was hard for him to give that up. Why, why I think, wasn't, it, all, wasn't it the choral fantasy? I think that was his last attempt at performing. I think it got so separated in the concert. Did he play the piano for that? I think yeah. he did. Yeah, because okay. yeah. you have the big ends in the beginning. But I think once the orchestra got going, I think it got so pulled apart that I think that was the last mm. straw. Well, and also remember those pieces were under rehearse. They had just gotten the pieces. Nobody knew them. You know, what, whoever was conducting didn't know the works. They might, even if they sat with them while he was cop, while the parts were being copied out, you still couldn't absorb it that fast. Right. So uh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting to hear. Just here's a shout out to a friend of ours in Hershey, um, to Joyce Shadow, who used to play in our trumpet section. Um, Joyce, we're all with you. And um, we love you, and uh, um, and we wish you all the best. Um, geez, so why don't we talk about metronome markings a little bit? I would just really be curious to see. <laughs> to well, that now that I can ask this question, how how uh, much did the Gonari Quartet take that into account as you prepared the Beethoven Quartets? And we, we thought nothing about it. Really? Absolutely nothing. Well, you guys did a really good job. <laughs> you must have really had good instincts. Yeah. Because yeah. you nailed them all. Yeah. So I think Michael Tree was the custodian of the metronome. And once in a while, he would say, well, the Beethoven metronome for this is so, 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 so. And Arnold, Arnold would say, we can't do that. I mean, that's, that's much too fast. I mean, come on. You, you <laughs> <laughs> oh, we would argue about it, and then we would put it aside and, and begin to rehearse. But I remember your Opus 59, number three, when you did that at Yale. It was fast. 
it was exciting. It was great. That's the one that's in the um, movie High Fidelity. That's yeah. how it ends. And I just I was I just watched that over and over and over again. And it's up on YouTube, as you might guess. And um, people still think that that's kind of the epitome of, uh, of 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 what a quartet performance could and should be. Uh, I when I was a kid, I used to think the Budapest was the ideal for that. Well, and guess what? Guess what? It's the Guarneri Con- now. The uh, series of the Library of Congress, you know, in the fifties. Right. With, I'm uh, a little too young to remember that, with, uh, but I know what you mean. Chuck Gordetsky playing second fiddle. And if you uh, listen closely, you can't tell Gordetsky from uh, Roisman. It sounded that, exactly the that's same. A great chamber, that's a yeah. great chamber music group. That was kind of spooky. They sounded exactly the same, like the, the same person. Speaking of high fidelity, I just want to point out um, for our listeners, John Daly and Nancy Daly are the parents of our own Eric Daly and the Hershey Symphony principal bass. I'm so thrilled that he is with us. And even better than that, we've got grandson Nathan Daly playing with festival strings. This makes me feel so good to see this keep on going. You know, Sandy, that's been a wonderful experience for Eric. And you know, he's playing concerts and he's teaching. And we're so thankful for his beginnings with you in uh, in Ridgewood. In Ridgewood, yeah. Yeah, and God bless you, Sandy. You've done a great job in our son's life. Well, thank you. He's a great son. I hope he's going to be watching here. And he's a wonderful bass player, and he's a superb section leader. And your grandson, I look at him with his violin case, and I say, <laughs> he looks like John Daly. He, he looks like John Daly. I don't know, he walks like you or something. So you got a good thing going there. So, uh, John, do you have anything else to say? No. Geez, there's a man of few words, and I was hoping you were going to talk and talk and talk. Are you a bow maker? Uh, Did I read that correctly someplace? That's correct. Yeah. How long have you been making bows? Uh, Since the early 60s. Oh. Oh. Wow. Just violin bows? Everything. Oh, man. Oh. Cello bass. Get your red hot John Daly cello bow. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Patrick, do you need a new oh. bow? Big one, you know. <laughs> That's all my publicity back there. <laughs> well, actually, now you, um, just to pull pull another family connection in, uh, John Daly, John Daly's father was part of the initial um organizing structure of the Interlochen, the, the National Music Camp, which is now called International uh, Interlochen Arts Camp. Yeah. But your whole family was involved with that. And they have a lovely house on the lake that I was lucky enough to visit when I was there. Yeah. And uh, that has changed so many lives as well. That's true. So yeah, and many, many stories that go along with that. Um, and Patrick, even before the, oh, excuse no, me. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Um, even before the, the interlocking days, I was reading, you were in Wichita, your family was in Wichita or Winfield. Wichita, yes. Yeah, yeah. And all the, my dad all the had great the things. Yeah, the professional orchestra in 40, 46 to 50. Uh-huh. Yeah. And Patrick was in the Wichita Symphony. How many years ago, Patrick? Oh, wow. Uh, two and a half or so i think when he, when he was a doctoral student he used to fly out to wichita to play in the orchestra yeah. and i got this job couldn't do both wichita wichita was a great city they had a they had uh, four high schools that had orchestras choruses and bands they had a youth symphony that my dad started they had the Friends University and the Wichita State University and orchestras, and then they had the professional orchestra. So there was music everywhere. That's wonderful. From a junior, from your junior all the way up. It was a great, he had a great, had had a great uh, uh, ambiance for, for music. Well, surprisingly enough, Fairbanks, Alaska was like that also. Really? I, I don't know that I would have stayed for 35 years had it not been like that. The Fairbanks Symphony is is quite good. There's a thriving Suzuki program. 
We've gotten kids to the point that they can, you know, several of our students have gotten into Juilliard and, and lots of conservatories. And everybody sort of laughs and says, well, there's nothing else to do in Alaska but practice. But there <laughs> are things to do in Alaska besides practicing, but it's a, it's a thriving string community. And it's, it's surprising to a lot of people. And when I relocated back to New Jersey where I grew up and went to school, the string players, you know, in New Jersey are, are much far and few between, you know, unless you go into New York, it's hard to get really top teaching. Right. And so it was, uh, it was a surprise when I, when I went to Alaska, I thought I'd be there for a year and that would be the end. And I had been, I had been finishing a doctorate. Then I had a Fulbright, I was in Vienna and then I went to Fairbanks. So it was a big change and I figured one year and that would be it. And then 34 years later, we and left. Three, and three cello players. And three cello players later, we left. Yeah. Well, I, remember, I remember asking my parents uh, after, way after we were in Wichita, I said, what, who, who was responsible for getting that sort of music going in Wichita? I mean, it was there somebody who got that going? And they said there was a woman by the name of Irene Meyer who conducted, I think, one of the high school orchestras. And she got all the, the boards of education behind her. And so she got all these music programs started in Wichita. Wow. So from, from being a kid, you know, growing up on through high school and university, uh, there, was a, there was something to do. Yeah. There was a group to play in. Well, that's the way it was for Patrick and his brothers. His older brother and and two of the, two of the three boys ended up going to Juilliard after growing up in Fairbanks, mm. wow. and uh, they were playing late Beethoven string quartets. We had a, a thriving chamber music program, and I didn't play late Beethoven until I got to Juilliard. And and speaking of playing the viola, I was the violist in 132, and it was my first experience ever playing the viola. I could barely read the alto clef, and here I was playing late Beethoven with Samuel Rhodes right behind me, sort of unhappy yeah. with most of what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but Fairbanks is similar to Wichita in that respect. I mean, it's it's thriving, unbelievable as that may sound. You know, one yeah, thing that think there's, one there's thing so that I think outside of New York City, it's the exact opposite. There's more music out there. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Right. One thing that encourages me is to see how people throughout the world, not just here, not just in places that have a Western music tradition, but all over the world, Asia, it's taken over by storm, how people love this music, how they can't get enough of it, how um, these quartets, these trios, uh, the sonatas, everything are, you, you have new listeners and new players who are hungry for this. If you want to see something, if you want to see something great, speaking about cross culture, uh, go to YouTube and put in the search bar the uh, Czech Philharmonic with, uh, Kubelik. with Raphael Kubelik conducting in My Fatherland of Smetana in Tokyo, Japan, and go to the very end, play the whole thing. And when the piece ends, the people went wild. Mm. They applauded for, he could hardly, he could hardly get off the stage. That makes me feel yeah. good about what we do. Yeah. Well, if you watch I, that video, you'll be absolutely amazed at the reception. Oh. Tech music in Tokyo. I'll look that yeah, up. What's Patrick. In our country? What's happened in our country? We're going down the tube. Well, it's a challenge. Yeah. But, yeah. but there are people that are trying to meet that challenge. The new generation like Patrick. What were you about to say, Patrick? Well, I was just, I, that's an interesting point about, you know, cross culture and, and, and just, you know, where I live. And actually, Sandy, I think you sent me an article right when I moved down here about the McAllen Edinburgh mission area was the, most impoverished region of the country. Um, and I mean, down here, it, the classical music, Beethoven is not in the culture at all. So if you, you know, one big part of my job is I teach a lot of music appreciation. So you, most of the time you have kids who just have never, ever been exposed to this music. Or if you play a, a 
recording of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or Mozart's 40th. Oh, I saw that in a commercial or I saw that in this movie, you know, that type of response. But one of, I mean, usually my favorite, and one of the best parts about teaching the class is if you play um, Beethoven for the kids. You know, obviously you're going to have kids who resist it and don't like it, but you always have at least one or two who are really just amazed with it. And and frankly, they always ask me, and I and obviously I end up talking a lot about Beethoven. We talk a lot about string quartet, symphonies, all that fun stuff. But, you know, and then someone says, well, why do you like this so much? Why is this so special? And I, I mean, it, it, it's something I really had to think about the first time someone asked this to me, uh, asked me this you know, why is it so special? I mean, at least for me, I feel like every time I play the chamber music, symphonies, whatever it is, there's always something new that I notice in this this, this music. I, there's always some little marking or some little detail, something you hear in the second violin part that you didn't hear the first time, you know, something- Some relationship that you overlooked. Yeah, and exactly. And it's just, and also with the ingenuity of how he, you know, forms these pieces and how he, you know, pushes the boundaries of music through um, his uh, string quartets and also establishing standards for the future. And I think that's that's something for me that I always find interesting and fun, kind of introducing Beethoven to people for the very first time. I find that to be a very, you know, and I always tell them, you know, on the first or second day of class, you know, I feel like I will be successful if, you know, you hear Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or you hear, you know, Mozart 40th in a commercial. And instead of you say, oh, I know that song, you say that's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. That's, you know, whatever piece it is. So, I mean, that's always something that I found really interesting. And, you know, because moving down here, I it's been an experience kind of to wrap my head around the culture and find a way to relate and introduce these um, composers that are hundreds of years old to people who, in some senses, maybe don't know they like it or are resisting liking it, but they end up at the end, you know, really being interested. How can you not like this if it gets introduced to you the right way? If you have yeah. what we call the right entry level experience, you will fall in love. Yeah. And, uh, well, I it's really funny you say that because I just I have some students I teach music appreciation I also teach music history so a lot of the times I have rollover of kids who have taken music appreciation and want to come into music history and I just got a message from an email from someone about a day ago saying that Beethoven made them want to learn more about music oh, and I thought that was very interesting and I went down to McAllen it was my first long distance clinic that I was invited to give wow. a friend okay. of mine in grad school who had just newly become uh, one of the teachers there. Okay. The, the program was new. Yep. It went up to maybe 10th grade. I think they'd started, you know, a group of kids each year. And it was, they told me that the school district was maybe 90 or even more percent um, Hispanic. Yep. And so a lot of these kids came from very poor, very poor circumstances. But the one thing they told me that the parents were very aware of the fact that they were in the U.S. and the opportunities that would be theirs because they were on the northern side of the border. Yep. So they said, come and work with our string festival. And uh, so I did something with whatever this this level and that level. And I don't remember much else except the grand finale was my arrangement of William Tell, which had open string beginner parts. So you could have even the beginners play. Mm -hmm. Everybody could play. And we, we got, you know, the kids, the beginners, especially at the end, they stand up. I, I listened to this tape and I was just marveled over it. Um, the, the little kids stood up and they had their part memorized. And you hear this buzz, buzz, buzz from the audience because there's my little daughter. There's my little son, my beloved son. And so they started playing their open string uh, in the um, coda to William Tell Overture. And who doesn't get excited by the William Tell Overture? Even right. if it's just strings, you're going to get excited. Yeah, the Lone Ranger. The Lone exactly, Ranger. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody knows it. So what I do remember is this, that the piece still had about 30 bars to go. And the audience, because they all know it, 
Yeah. Started clapping. I, I knew you were going to say that. That's yeah, still they, knew, they, they knew the end was coming and they just started clapping. And I mean, it drowned out. I mean, I just, I have this on a recording and I'd never experienced that anywhere else. They were just so pleased that their kids were in the midst of making these sounds. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. Well, you know, along these same lines, um, in Alaska, there's the Arctic Chamber Orchestra, where we take music out to the villages, to all the bush communities. And I don't know if you really ever went on any of these bush tours, Patrick. Yeah, I did. I went but in, the, in the, well, the really rugged ones. But in the early days, I mean, I went up there in 1979. So you couldn't use your computer and listen to a concert on the computer. So we took all the music out to the people. And we went to Eskimo communities who had never heard a live concert before, who had never seen a stringed instrument. And they would be dancing during the, you know, it's not typical concert etiquette at these concerts. They would be maybe in the all purpose room of the school or the gym or something like that. And we would set up and play school concerts and evening concerts and same response. I mean, the people were so excited. They were literally dancing around as we were playing. And we, and we did this for years and now with the computer age the orchestra doesn't do that so much but uh and it, it got rave reviews even in the new york papers you know this orchestra was written up doing all this stuff and that was my introduction to flying and four-seater planes and that sort of, i'm not an avid flyer and now i absolutely detest it after flying around in all kinds of weather in four seaters oh. and you know wait a minute you and the cellist and the cello and the pilot, something like that. No, it would, well, um, the orchestra was about 40 people. So we would take a 40 seater out to a more or less major airport. And from there, they would hire small planes. And so maybe four or five people would go in each plane and they'd have, you know, wow. half a dozen planes. We traveled on small planes. We traveled on dog sleds. We traveled in boats, school God. buses, you name it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was on a dog sled coming into Savunga, which is in the southwest part of the state. And my bridge actually moved a little bit to the right because the snow was so packed down. It was so cold. And so at the well, time, the you know, along and just right in the base gate, no? Yeah. <laughs> wrap it around you. I mean, it's, there were many stories about this. It was it was rugged, but um, it was interesting and it was important. I mean, the conductor felt that it was really important and part of the mission of the university to to bring music out to these communities. Well, yes, because who else would bring it out? Yeah. John, I want to tell you that a couple years ago, and I think you were actually were at that concert because Nathan was playing um, with the Festival Strings, our Gypsy concert, and. Um, we performed the Schoenberg orchestration of the Brahms G minor piano quint piano quartet, the finale, the Gypsy Rondo, which right. is a wild enough piece the way it's written. But uh, Schoenberg made it even stranger with the xylophone. Yeah. Um, but what what one of the members of the Hershey Symphony, and it wasn't Eric, uh, one of the members said, "You have to listen to this recording," and it was a recording of you. And that must have that must have been at the year when you guys were, were doing all kinds of alternative configurations because Arnold Steinhardt was was injured, if I'm not mistaken. And well, so you got a chance to get into other literature finally. He was out for two seasons with uh, operation on his Olin nerve. Oh, uh, well, he lost two seasons. Oh, well. Are you we, talking about are you are you talking about the, uh, the recording from Paris? It might, it w might well have been. I just know that it knocked my socks out. I just like, oh my gosh, that was so exciting. So I know that's not Beethoven, but it that. was exciting. Somebody bootlegged that off the TV and they, they kept selling it on the, on the black. Everything on YouTube is bootlegged in one way or another. <laughs> so, you know, we, we kind of make our peace with that. And the way I look at it is no publicity is bad publicity, right? Right. There you go. Um, Patrick, do you have anything more you want to share with us? We did talk about, we talked about sonatas about a week or two, a week or two ago, right. but what about trios and quartets? 
Well, I, I feel like it all kind of ties together, you know, and actually, you know, we were before we were we were in our current situation of COVID-19, we were planning on uh, uh, a colleague of mine and myself were planning on doing a a, a cycle of the Beethoven sonatas, the the, um, uh, the cello sonatas. And with that, we were going to pair um closely related chamber music works um with some of our other colleagues and i think we decided on with the um with the opus fives we were going to uh, i think we were actually going to do the um uh, opus one number one because the uh the opus five sonatas i think are 1796 and opus one number one is 1795 i'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, I don't recall exactly. I, I, I think so. And then, you know, if you, uh, we were going to do the ghost trio with the opus 69 and then, uh, one of the late Beethoven's with the opus one Oh twos. And we planned all this out and we were going to do it over three concerts, early, middle, and late. And I, we, I, and you know, we got everyone together and it was a group, I think of about 15 people of everyone doing this big Beethoven celebration that was supposed to happen, I think next Monday, but, next monday right well, yeah. <laughs> talk about raining on everybody's parade yeah. i i need to re i need to remind our audience of one thing since we have nancy daly in the background behind john nancy also uh solo with the hershey symphony when we did uh, brandenburg four she and lydia klinger played the flute parts and john played that fiendishly fiendishly fast violin part thank you for doing that and uh, um, didn't want that to slip my mind since she was in the frame there. And yeah, that we, we, everything rained on Beethoven's parade. That's why we have belated birthday cards. Right, yeah. Are we gonna party once this rolls by? We're gonna play more Beethoven and more and more and more. And I don't care that it's a year late. Yeah. I'm just glad we're gonna get to do it. We're going to try it in the spring. And actually, I guess a little over a year ago, they did another Beethoven celebration here. And it was a program of the triple concerto and the choral fantasy, which ended up and they were actually thinking of doing it during this year. But in hindsight, it was probably smart to not do it during this year. Right. Everything that was planned for this year right. just got it's, shut down, yeah. which is unfortunate. So, John, do you know anybody who's doing live concerts or not? No, I didn't think so. So we're all just staying at home, baking cookies and practicing. And cleaning out boxes, cleaning out closets, yeah. all that fun stuff. Right, right, all that fun stuff. <laughs> Kathy, do you have anything to tell us? I have another question. Um, I'm sure everybody has asked you this a million times, but how did the quartet decide to disband? <laughs> uh, I hear Nancy in the background again. Yeah, I think. They were tired. <laughs> I think Arnold said uh, one day he said, uh, you know, I I think I have to stop at the end of the season. And so we said, okay, that's all right. It's probably about time. That was it. I missed them. So do we. I wanted, I told Arnold, you need to do one more Beethoven cycle. That's said, right. What do you oi, think? Oi. Would you yeah. kill me? That's right. It, that would be, that would be what it would take. That, that would probably be the end result. That would uh, be the yeah. Another Beethoven. Right. <laughs> but we are so grateful that you brought us so much music, not just Beethoven, but I mean, Beethoven is the first thing that comes to my mind, but all that, it, all that other great music besides Thank you so much, Guaneri Quartet, for just drawing a different line in the sand. And all of us then had something new to aspire to and had 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 mentors to learn learn from along the way. Am I saying that right, Nancy? Does that sound good? Yeah. So we're grateful for the Guaneri Quartet. Uh, like I said, you guys appeared when I was a student. And I'm so glad that you've been around for as long as you had been and that you taught us as much as you did and left behind as much great music as you did. Thank you, you're very kind. Well, uh, um, it, it's the truth. It's very true. Yeah. 
Invite her over to come by the fire pit, John. See if they can come in the fire oh. pit. Tell her. She's, <laughs> she's in Patterson. Yeah, we have a fire pit. We have it out on the patio. We have a, 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 a stone patio. Oh, how lovely outside. that sounds. Sit around the fire. We'll be there. We'll be there. Would you come? We will come. And it's actually when the COVID is done, Patrick will come visit his mom. And we'll all three of us come. I guess I can now. I just have to quarantine for 14 days. <laughs> yeah, right now is not the time. Right now is not the time. But we would we would love to do that, Nancy. It would feel like old times to do that. Patrick, got any any closing thoughts to leave us with? Well, one thing I, I, I find myself very lucky. I got to see, I think it was one of your last performances with the Schubert Quintet with David Sawyer in New York. Oh. Which was still or or one of the, that was pretty amazing. And also when I was Is that Carnegie Hall? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah, I was at Carnegie Hall. Was that with I, both cellists? With Peter Wiley and Peter Wiley and David Sawyer. Yeah. yeah, and oh. when I was in school at Juilliard, I one of the instruments they lent me was the. It was an English cello that David Sawyer used to teach on when oh. he was uh, when he was teaching there. And also once I did get to play for Mr. Sawyer, and he was very frank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think being very kind. Yeah, he, well, he, he he was nice, but he was very frank. Let's just say that. <laughs> Cut right to the chase. Yeah, yeah. Well, we Kathy and I were just talking earlier today. I think what was the word you used, Kathy? He's he's like he he plays like the like a bear. bear. Yeah, you know, and that just kind of drives the whole thing. Oh yeah, um, there's so much bass there exactly yeah. and man uh, bring it on i mm -hmm. think that's that's terrific that's that just gives everybody such a satisfying experience mm -hmm. i'm going to wrap up by saying i love beethoven i can't get enough of him i can't get enough of the chamber music and i didn't even talk about all of it in these all these different programs we've done i never got to the wind chamber music other than the horn sonata there's so much else there's incidental stuff there's stuff without opus that's not on anybody's radar screen. And all of it is satisfying. It may not all be equally great, but it's all satisfying. And the stuff that's great is transcendental. So my life is enriched as a result of somebody, somebody who was born 250 years ago. And I'll dedicate a part of my life, I'll continue to, to making sure that that tradition goes on giving, giving pleasure and provocation to those who follow because we are so lucky we had a musician like that live in our midst. You'll do it. You'll do it. Well, thank you. <laughs> Kathy, Patrick, come on. Put in your last word. Well, this has been fun. It's as I said before, it's been a real honor to do this. I agree. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, we have um we have this program we're not done yet. We have several more that we are taping. One will be, and I'm, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag entirely, but we have an A-list lineup of local conductors in Pennsylvania doing a show about just the symphonies. That's going to be a blowout because we'll probably all talk at the same time, knowing conductors. <laughs> and uh, we also have one coming up with call directors on the Beethoven Choral Works Chorus and Orchestra, the big three, the big four actually. Um, plus, if we have time, we're try gonna try to get in some of the opera. And even so, there's so much we've left out, so much I'd love to have had time to get into because one thing just, it's like pulling a thread on a sweater. It just, it just leads to something else. And um, this is what's so good about this. But it's a lifetime but, project. I mean, Beethoven it, it is really a lifetime is. project. It is, and I don't understand. I did, certainly didn't understand when I was a student, the things I understood later when I was a teacher and the things I understood later when I was a mature teacher and learning as a conductor just gives you a whole different perspective. So last last chance, anybody else have any, any final words? Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Susan Court, for bringing us all together. And thank you, all of our sponsors at the Hershey Symphony. You're the reason the music can continue, even though this magnificent theater behind me is still actually not, not being used for music yet, but it will be soon. And we look forward to all of you joining us on that day. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Sandy. We really appreciate it. And many thanks to Kathleen and Patrick and John and Nancy for sharing your gifts and your insights about Beethoven. We're very excited to be able to celebrate his music as we mark his 250th birthday. And we're very thankful that you joined us for another episode of Sandy and Friends. Good night and take care. <laughs>